All right. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Jeffrey Young. I'm a senior computer science and quantitative bio major, uh, and I do research under the direction of Dr. Martin Steiner. Uh, and today I'm going to be giving a talk on uh, early postnatal anesthesia exposure reduces white matter microorganization. So I just wanted to start by giving a background on anesthesia exposure. Um, so it's obvious that anesthetic drugs at some threshold have neurotoxic effects, right? They do this for, you know, this is true of all drugs, ibuprofen, aspirin, all drugs at some level, some high level are going to have some sort of neurotoxic effects, right? And that's well established uh, with anesthetics used uh, in medicine today. Um, but what we're interested in in this study is looking at what are the effects of clinically relevant doses of anesthesia exposure, okay? Specifically in early brain development. Uh, most of the studies so far have been in animal models. There really haven't been a lot of studies, like I said, on clinically relevant exposures, but the few that have have been in animal models. Uh, and there's been limited human studies. The reason why is because in any human study is inherently biased because it's a retrospective analysis where it's difficult to control for the initial indication for surgery, right? You have two populations, one who needed the surgery and one who didn't, and it's very hard to control for that in the analyses. The FDA, although there has been little research on this topic, they did, it was strong enough for them in 2012 to come out with this recommendation that elective surgical procedures uh, should be avoided in children under the age of three. Uh, and they called for more research, looking at uh, some other drugs. Um, yeah. So the state of the field is, is uncertainty right now. Um, and so that's where macaques come in. Like I mentioned, it's difficult to do these studies and get good information in humans. Uh, macaques, we don't have that problem. We can uh, have rigorous experimental control. Uh, they're the most common translational model used to study both typical and atypical neurodevelopment. Uh, they're very similar anatomically, much closer so than rodents, which are also a commonly used um, translational model. You can see here, this is a compared MRI between a human and a macaque uh, at about age 12 months, and you can see the brains look very similar. Uh, they have prehensile hands and feet, meaning they can grasp objects, and just like humans, uh, they live in social groups. So uh, let's talk about the dif demographics for our study. So the important thing to note here is that we have replicated these results in two distinct cohorts at two distinct locations, two different anesthetic protocols, two different scanning protocols, right? Two completely different scenarios. We have replicated these results. The first one, the macaques were housed at the University of Wisconsin. Uh, and you can see the protocol there. Subjects younger than six months of age were given uh, inhalant isoflurane, had about 90 minutes of exposure time. Uh, protocol two, the older subjects were given ketamine with this dexmedetomidine. 36 subjects in the Wisconsin cohort scanned longitudinally five times from age two weeks to 36 months of age. That's roughly the same from birth to about 12 to 13 years of age in humans. Then the Emory cohort, these are macaques scanned at the University of, or Emory University. Uh, they were given a combination of telazol, inhalant isoflurane, and ketamine. It's important to note that if you went to the hospital tonight for some minor procedure, the emergency room, whatever, you would be given these same drugs. These are the same drugs used every day in hospitals around the world. So uh, we used MRI in this study, but what most people don't realize is that there are many modalities of MRI, right? So you're probably most familiar looking at the one I showed you a few slides ago. That's called a T1 image. Here we were interested in looking uh, using diffusion tensor imaging, or DTI. DTI measures the diffusion of water, the diffusion of hydrogen atoms along the white matter fiber tracks. So the brain is two major pieces. There's the gray matter. This is where consciousness lives. This is where thought happens. You know, it's the CPU of the computer. And then there's the white matter. These are the connections, the wiring in the brain that allows different parts of the brain to communicate with itself. Okay, and DTI tells us the local orientation of these white matter fiber tracks and can give us an idea of their, their makeup, right? Uh, the integrity of the white matter fiber tracks. Um, you know, the math details aren't too important here, but we model each point, right? We parameterize the white matter fiber tracks. We model each point by a mathematical object called a tensor. Uh, and there's different parameters we can extract from these, namely axial diffusivity, mean diffusivity, radial diffusivity, and the important one that we're gonna talk about most today, fractional anisotropy, or FA. FA is a measurement between zero and one. That's once again thought to measure the directedness of the diffusion. A good way to think about it is the integrity of the white matter fiber tracks. Um, just like wires have insulation wrapped around them, uh, white matter fiber tracks are, are the same way. They're wrapped in myelin insulation to prevent signal degradation as the brain is sending um, these electrical impulses. So 
the integrity of, of the white matter fiber tracks, you know, diseases like Parkinson's directly, what they're doing is they're reducing the integrity of these white matter fiber tracks. So it's very important from a health perspective that, that these are functioning properly. So I'll, I'll walk you briefly through the processing. It's not too important uh, for this talk. You know, we have all of our raw images. We construct an average, an atlas, we call it. Uh, that was done using a symmetric diffeomorphic atlas building process. We then propagate tracks from an existing high resolution post-mortem atlas. The reason why we create an atlas is because we can do all of our um, processing in a single image and then use the computed deformation fields to propagate that to the individual images. Right? That makes it a lot easier on all parts. Instead of doing something 200 times, we only have to do it once. So we perform tractography in the atlas space. You can see the atlas image there. Notice this is a DTI image, so it looks a little different than um, traditional MRI images. We can extract the diffusion profiles for each fiber tract, uh, compute statistics, and merge those back onto the tract. So the statistical analysis was first preceded as basically all steps in the processing pipeline by manual uh, processing, manual quality control. We used a generalized linear model with covariates age, sex, and the number of prior exposures. Uh, and the number of prior exposures was the one we found significance in. Neither age nor sex were, were significant in driving the changes that we saw. Uh, here you can see how we merged the statistics back onto the track after we compute them. So these are the betas from the GLM merged onto a track called the ILF, or the Inferior Longitudinal Fasciculus. This is a track that originates uh, in the back of the brain and uh, inserts into the temporal lobe right behind the ear. So let's look at some results. So here I'm showing you the omnibus local p-values, FPR corrected, merged back onto the fiber track. And you can see, you can't really see much. It's just all red. And, and that, that's good news for us. Well, bad news depending on how you look at it if you've been exposed, but it's good news for, for this study, right? We see high significance everywhere along the tracks, you know, less than one times 10 to the negative six in terms of the p-values, okay? And it turns out when you look at the, um, the post hocs, when you look at the post hoc local p-values, it's the number of prior exposures, once again, driving these changes. We don't see significance in sex and age when we look at the post hocs, when we look at the individual parameters of the model, it's uh, the number of prior exposures that's driving this significance. So a lot of images here, but let me break it down for you. you know, the key takeaway as I talk through this is greater exposures, as you have higher exposure to anesthesia, we see greater diffusivity and reduced FA, a reduction in the overall integrity of the white matter fiber tracks. So here we see the corrected betas here, then the average FA, this is what you would expect for an average macaque, the average integrity, you see it varies across the brain. Some tracks are more developed than others. It's just how it is. The relative betas are the key thing to pay attention here to. The relative betas are just the corrected betas divided by the average FA. And what you see here is, is really quite a stunning effect, right? So you see, we see a stronger effect in the Emory cohort versus the Wisconsin cohort, right? We see darker colors compared to Wisconsin. That's mainly a product of the fact that the Emory subjects were exposed more um, for husbandry reasons, for uh, Emory University just tends to be a lot more liberal in their use of anesthetics, because it, it wasn't thought to, to cause a problem, really, you know. We've been using it used in hospitals every day. But what you see here is the difference between a subject uh, with zero exposures versus four exposures, you know, a 25% difference, that's what this greenish blue area is telling you, a 25% impact to the overall white matter integrity from just four short hour and a half clinically relevant doses of anesthetics. You know, this is, you know, if you'd have told me we were gonna find 2%, 5%, I would have been, you know, that's enough to take notice, right? 2%, 5%, we're talking about the brain here. You know, that, that's a big difference. We're seeing upwards of 25% of an impact on the overall white matter integrity, which is really uh, just shocking. So, you know, uh, it's worth repeating again, increased levels of diffusivity, which correlates to decrease in FA, and an overall reduction in their white matter integrity. And really, we see that exposure causes measurable effects uh, on development. So I think these, perhaps, these charts uh, are the most illustrative of the point. So here are just two randomly selected tracks. Uh, here we have the GNU. The GNU is this horseshoe-shaped tract that sits in the front of the brain and crosses over the midline. And you see here, this is a subject with zero prior exposures. This is what we would, this is you know, it's fractional anisotropy plotted along the arc length of the tract. 
And then this is a subject with four prior exposures. So just four short exposures to drugs you would get tomorrow if you went uh, to, to have anesthesia in the developing brain have a significant impact. I mean, look at how this is a carbon copy of the, the red line is a carbon copy of the green line, but shifted down by such a significant amount. Um, you know, it, you know, like I said, once again, it would have been significant if you would have just seen, you know, these would have been just kind of really close together, almost right on top of each other. The fact that you can see a clear separation to the naked eye, right? You don't even have to use statistics to tell you <laughs> that something here, right, there's a, there's a problem. We see this across all major tracks. You know, here's just another one. A uh, pretty important one. This is the, the optic tract uh, on the left side. The optic tract originates in the back of the brain uh, in the occipital lobe responsible for vision, uh, crosses at the optic chiasm, and is integral in, uh, in vision. Once again, the same story. Just four prior exposures, we see measurable, significant impact on the overall white matter integrity, on the ability of the brain to communicate with itself. So, of course, with any study, there are limitations. You know, we had no handle control group, uh, would be the first main one. For the Wisconsin, this is only true, the second bullet is only true of the Wisconsin cohort. But for the Wisconsin cohort, the number of exposures and the age of exposure are confounded. We were able to separate that confound in the Emory data. And finally, neither of these studies were actually designed to investigate anesthesia exposure. When the case of the Wisconsin study, that study was designed just to investigate what does typical development look like, right? We were interested in characterizing that. And we started looking at subjects that were the same age, yet had completely different developmental profiles, and you know, something's up here. Same thing with the Emory data. The Emory data, we actually took uh, control subjects that were used in a study looking at the effects of maternal abuse on brain development. Um, and we saw this, you know, once we found the, the results in the Wisconsin data, we set out to replicate it, and we did, in the Emory cohort. So, you know, it would be nice in the future uh, to have uh, some, you know, just studies solely uh, devoted to uh, anesthesia exposure at these short doses, but, you know, the problem is nobody thought there would be an effect. You know, this is really quite shocking that, once again, these short doses cause such a measurable impact. Um, and yeah, in the future, we need to look at the effects of um, uh, cognitive effects. So clearly there are brain effects, and almost certainly there's some effects on the, you know, the, the ability of the macaque to, say, like, perform memorization tasks. You know, we can do these sorts of testing, but they weren't done in this case. Um, but that's something we hope to do soon uh, and publish this work. Uh, hopefully, if all goes well, uh, in a few months. Thanks. Yeah. How do you know that this is just not short term? Like the effects aren't just short -term. So there have been studies done to show that you know, the brain is incre incredibly plastic, right? We've heard, all heard of neuroplasticity. The brain has these amazing regenerative powers. So there is certainly some, as they continue to develop, some catch up, right? This, this, uh, let me go back. This line probably gets, this red line probably gets closer to this green line over time. But in just my intuition and just looking at previous studies, you know, it, it will not catch up all the way because once again, this is such a measurable, this is such a big hit mm -hmm. to their development. I mean, these monkeys are at least a year, 18 months behind where they should be. Um, and, and so there's probably some catch up over time, but something like this, this is such a big hit that the brain could never fully recover. Mm -hmm. Do you tell if, was, if there's any difference between the number of times exposed or it's the total time? So, so we can't because each each um, exposure was for the same duration. So, unfortunately, that can't be separated in this analysis. But we do think there is some cumulative dose effect where the more exposures you're getting, and we can actually test that with the data, and we did see that where the more exposures you're getting, um, the more severe the effect. We're working now on doing a more nuanced analysis, looking at the actual amounts of anesthetic given versus just discrete number of exposures, um, and that's being written up now. <coughs> 